Hello, and welcome to our History Brown Bag. Thank you very much for attending. My name is Elizabeth Kellums, and I am the Historic Preservation Planner for the City of Greeley. If you have questions, please type them in the Q&A feature, and Professor June will answer them after his presentation. Dr. June is Professor and Coordinator of Africana Studies at the University of Northern Colorado. His specialty is African American History and Culture. He has written on the African-American town of Deerfield, Colorado, and Ottoman African eunuchs. His book, The Black Eunuchs of the Ottoman Empire, Networks of Power in the Court of the Sultan, was published in 2016. During the summers, Dr. June is a fossil collector for the University of Michigan Museum of Paleontology. He also works with Professor Emeritus Robert Brunswick and his UNC archeology span crews at North Park, Colorado on Native American historical sites. Since the year 2000, June has been a visiting professor at a university in Istanbul. He holds a PhD from the University of Michigan. Please join me in welcoming Professor June. Thank you, everyone. Today, we're gonna to talk about the black pilots of World War I. And even today, there seems to be some controversy in the minds of some people surrounding the flying careers of African-American fighter pilots. There were some books that have been published, one titled The Lafayette Flying Corps, and another one uh, with a similar title. And nowhere is there a mention of our first pilot that we talk about, Eugene Jacques Ballard. So what's going on now is that there is more information coming that's being gathered about these black pilots in World War I. And in fact, for those of you who are in Greeley, if you go to the University of Northern Colorado Library, there is a book, I call it a yearbook, that is about the Lafayette Escadrille where Corporal Eugene Jacques Ballard uh, flew for. And you can see two photographs of him in that particular book. So what I'm first going to do is talk about Corporal Eugene Jacques Ballard and his military history and how he became a pilot in World War I. Now, Eugene was born in October 1894 in Columbus, Georgia. He was the seventh of 10 children born to a black man from Martinique and a Creek Indian woman. So if you go to the first slide, what you'll see are a composite of his life. <coughs> Excuse me. His family arrived, his father's family arrived in America as slaves when their French owner uh, fled the Haitian Revolution. His mother died at age 33 when he was five years old, leaving his father to raise him. Now, Eugene Bullard was kind of torn between family loyalty and also wanting more freedom. So he decided to leave home. And he left his home in Columbus, Georgia in 1902. <coughs> Excuse me. And <coughs> of all times to get a coughing fit. But he was eight years old when he left. I don't know what most of you are doing at eight years old, but I sure was not planning on running away from home. But his father had spoken to him many times about France. And his father had told him that in France, a man was accepted regardless of skin color. So at eight years old, he left home to go to France. Now he only had a fourth grade education. He wandered around the southern part of the United States looking for ways to travel to France. He worked his way in many odd jobs toward Norfolk, Virginia, and after four years of wandering, working at odd jobs, he stowed away on a German ship that went to Scotland. Now he was 12 years old. For about 10 years, he worked various jobs around Europe, found success as a welterweight boxer, and 
he also decided to join the French military in World War I. Now, one of the things that he decided to do was to join the Foreign Legion. Now, the, the, uh, the interesting aspect of the Foreign Legion is that they got people from many countries, is if you join the Foreign Legion, you did not lose your citizenship to the country that you came from. So that's why you have many foreign people joining the Foreign Legion, the French Foreign Legion. So he's now in World War I, he's not quite 19 years old. He loves his new country. He joins a Moroccan division. And he said that that division contained 54 different nationalities. Casualties were heavy. And on March 5th, 1916, at the Battle of Verdun, France, he received wounds that removed him from the ground war. And since he was no longer fit for duty in the infantry, he saw that as an opportunity to join, to join the French Flying Corps, the Lafayette Escadrille. And uh, just a, a word about uh, the Battle of Verdun that he was in. My father was in the military, and so I went to part of my high school in, the French, uh, in France that uh, our school was on the battlefield, one of the battlefields of Verdun, France. And in that battle, for three years, between 500 and 800,000 men were wounded or killed. And that's the battle that he was in. Now, the Lafayette Escadrille was formed out of the American Ambulance Service, and it was reserved for American Field Service people. It was organized by Dr. Edmund Gross, G-R-O-S, an American physician. And what they did is that uh, they formed this unit, and one was called the Escadrille American, which was run by the Americans, and the other was Lafayette Escadrille. Now, originally there were 38 pilots there, and Ballard decided that he wanted to join. And he didn't think that was going to be a problem because he had won the Croix de Guerre, the highest honor a military person could get in the fighting, and he got that with the Bronze Star at his bravery at Verdun. So after recovering from his wounds, he was drinking with three friends of his. One was a white Southerner, and a white Southerner was asking, what are you going to do? You can't fight with the injuries that you received. And he replied, he was going to go into French aviation. The Southern friend said, well, you know, there aren't any Negroes in aviation. And Ballard replied, sure I do. That's why I want to get into it. I'm in France, not in Mississippi. So he and other Americans joined the uh, Flying Corps and were awarded with a badge of pilot brevet with corporal stripes. And he served in combat from September 13 to November 11, 1917. So that made him one of the first black pilots in, 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 uh, in World War I. Now, the other thing that he did was that the white Southerner that said that he couldn't be a pilot, he had a bet with him when they were sitting at the cafe. And the bet was for $2,000. Now, the Southern white guy was very rich. Bullard didn't have anything except the dust that he had in his pocket. But after being accepted by the French Flying Corps, he went to his friends and his friend paid him $2,000 in cash. And you know, in uh, 1917, 1918, $2,000 was a lot of money. So Bullard be, uh, had uh, flown and he was wounded uh, a couple of times, but he claimed two kills on 20 missions. Only one was confirmed. And that was because in World War I, if you shot down a plane, you had to have it confirmed. In this case, the plane he shot down went behind German lines. So there was no one to confirm it. And no other pilots were around to see the plane go down. So therefore, um, he was kind of stuck. Now, if we could have the next slide, please. That's a picture of Ballard, and you can see under it, all blood runs red. And this is what he had painted on his aircraft. 
because he's saying in war, it doesn't matter color. If you bleed, you're going to bleed red blood. And that's the way that he believed. So French newspapers carried stories about Ballard, but American media did not mention him. And even when Americans entered the war, there was no mention of Ballard. He tried to seek a, a flying position in the American Flying Service, and there was an altercation between Ballard and a superior officer. And because of that, he was not allowed to join the American Flying Service. Other French officers saw this fight going on. They tried to intervene on sided with Ballard, but it didn't matter because the man that was there, Dr. Gross, did not want blacks flying. So he told Ballard that he could not fly. He said that um, there was something wrong with his feet and his tonsils were too large. So Ballard was rejected for a pilot uh, on the American side. Now, next slide, please. And this is a picture of Ballard and his pet monkey that he flew with. His pet monkey's name was George. So they had a pretty good time in flying. Now in October, 1919, Ballard was discharged from the armed forces of France. He was a national hero. He had a lot, he had a very significant standing in France. And he decided to remain in Paris and married a French countess. And with her, he had three children, one boy and two girls. Their marriage was in 1923 to a woman named Marcel Stroutman, very wealthy woman. They did separate in 1931, but because he was a noted personality in France, he managed nightclubs and so forth. So if we could have the next slide. There is, a, there is a, a, an advertisement for the club. And he managed several clubs. And along, and along with that, uh, African-American friends from the United States would drop in. And they would include the famous musician, Sidney Bichette, Louis Armstrong, the famous singer, Josephine Baker. And other people dropped in to say hello to him. And they included people, you might recognize a couple of these names, Charlie Chaplin, Gloria Swanson, the Prince of Wales, and so forth. So he also had his club that you can see, he taught boxing, he did massages, he had a ping pong table set up in there, and that was really significant for people. And also he did hydrotherapy. So anyone could go into his club and he managed several clubs. He got into a few fights with some people and uh, when that happened, it was very rare, but he would always win. Now, while he is in France, World War II approaches. In 1939, Eugene decides that he wants to uh, participate and he joined the French underground. He spoke three languages, including German, and before the war officially started, Germans would come into his club, but because they saw a black man, they assumed that he was too stupid to understand German, but he was taking all, everything that he could overhear and giving it to the French underground. After a while, he was forced to flee Paris with his daughters. He arrived in Orléans, he joined some troops there and decided to fight again to defend the city. He was barely wounded and rather than allowed him to be captured and uh, interrogated by the Gestapo, his friends smuggled him into Spain with his daughters and later he had a medical evacuation to the United States where he recovered in New York. He settled down to rebuild his life and he found work of um, among other jobs that he tried to get was an elevator operator at Rockefeller Center. 
and he would hold that job until he retired. Now, just a word about an elevator operator. This is an elevator so manually operated. You, so you open the outer door, the inner door, you close the doors, you pull the uh, cables to go up to the next floor, you announce the floor and all of that. So it was a full-time job, didn't pay a lot of money, but you could live off of it. And that's what he did. Now, he, after being, after being um, uh, retired, uh, the next slide shows what the French government, how they viewed him. So he was called to Paris in 1954, and he, among two white Frenchmen, would be chosen to light the flame at the tomb of the unknown soldier under the Arc de Triomphe. And finally, in 1959, the Today Show host, Dave Garraway, interviewed Bullard on the show. In the, about 1960, um, the French president, Charles de Gaulle, visited New York and publicly and internationally embraced Eugene Bullard as a true French hero. And finally, in, 19, in October 1961, after suffering a long illness due to the wounds that he received in World War I, Eugene Bullard passed away. But again, France did not forget. October 17, he was buried with the tricolors of France draping his coffin <coughs> and was laid in the French cemetery in Flushing, New York. So that's the story of Eugene Bullard. And why people in this country don't know about him either today remains a bit of a mystery to me and others as well. Now next we're going to take a look at Ahmed Ali Chalikton. He's also known as Arap Ahmed Ali or Ismirli Ahmed Ali. He, along with U.S. pilot Eugene Jopillard, were World War I fighter pilots. His mother, this is in the Ottoman Empire in Turkey, his, his grandmother came to the Ottoman Empire from Nigeria as a slave. Now, he was born in 1883 in present-day Izmir, and he wanted to become a sailor. He entered the Naval Technical School, and in 1908, he graduated from the school as first lieutenant. Then he took flying courses from the Naval Flight School. And during World War I, he was married to an immigrant from an Eastern European area. It was Ahmed Ali Chalikton who became the first military pilot in aviation history. And he started serving in 1916. And in 1918, he was sent by the Ottoman Empire to Berlin to complete his courses. Now, in aviation history, he received his wings, so-called, in 1915. And then we can see him next to his plane in the next slide. And Ballard is often cited as being the first black aviator, but it was this man who became, was really the first black aviator that we know, and he died in 1969. There's not a lot of records of him because after, doing it after World War I, and uh, uh, there were fires at certain places and so forth in Turkey, and so a lot of his records are gone, but we do know that he died in 1969. And so there you're looking at the first black pilot, even though he was on the other side, he was the first. So now what we're going to do is take a look at Marcel Pliot. Pliot was also known as Marseille Plague or Marcel Pliot. He was a black man and he served in the Russian Air Force. And he was a two-time recipient of the famous 
order of St. George for his actions. And he was the first black aviator credited with shooting down an aircraft while in combat. Now, the thing about this man, remember he is a black airman. He's fighting for Russia, but he's really from Tahiti. But to the Russians, he is a black man. So I put him in here because of the fact that he, and, and we, would not, we would not consider him of African descent or Africana person, but uh, probably South Pacific, but he, was, he has been um, written up as being a black man. So he was born in Tahiti in 1890, now was known as French Polynesia. At age 17, he moved to Russia with his mother, who was a nurse, and he became a volunteer in the Russian Air Force. Now, originally, he served as a driver, but he soon transferred to the Imperial Air Force, where he performed dual responsibilities. He was both a motor mechanic and a gunner. Now, on April 13, 1916, this man took part in an air raid on a fortified flak station, a German flak station. The aircraft crew of the Sikorsky 2 Ya. Uh, Moromet, the airplane took major damage from bullets and shrapnel. And in the next slide, we'll see a picture of that plane. With all the being hit by the shrapnel, uh, Pilot and others knew that the plane was going to crash because one of the engines had stopped working. Now, I don't know anything about aerodynamics. The plane could stay in the air, but if it tried to land, it would crash land. So knowing this, Pilat did something that only a few of us would have the guts to do. He put on his tool belt, crawled out on the wing of the plane, and you can see there's very little shelter from anything, crawled out on the plane's wing with his tools, repaired the engine, it took him an hour to do that. And due to his actions, the plane was able to land in spite of the fact that it suffered 70 bullet holes in the body, the wings, and the engine. And because of that, Pilat was awarded the title of senior non-commissioned officer. Now, he was also skilled as a marksman, so he was a tail gunner on another sophisticated bomber and he shot down three German fighter planes. Unfortunately, the fate of Pilat is not known after November 1916, and most of the imperial records were destroyed when the Bolsheviks came into power in Russia in 1917. Now, the next person that we'll look at is Robbie Clark. Robbie Clark, was uh, in 1914 when Britain and, and the British Empire went to war with Germany, he was one of the people who decided that he was going to participate in that. So he was born in Kingston, Jamaica on October 4, 1895. He got a decent uh, education. He was known as Robbie and he learned how to maintain motor cars and was one of the first men on this island of Jamaica that knew how to drive. He was employed as a chauffeur, 1915, traveled to Great Britain to play his part in the war, and he paid his own passage over there. So why? Why would an intelligent young man with a respectable job travel thousands of miles at his own expense to fight for a country that enslaved his ancestors. Well, there are over 15,000 black volunteers that joined, um, in, that joined England from the British West England, from British uh, West Indies. And some are listed for economic reasons, some for personal reasons, some to seek adventure. 
And there were those like Robbie that knew what was at stake. Black people were aware of the past. They knew what happened during the times of slavery. <clears throat> and they knew that if Britain lost a war and the Germans took over, what might happen to them? So he, among others, wanted to um, preserve their culture, their institutions, their ideals, and they also wanted to defend Christian civilization. And they also wanted to show that they were loyal subjects of his majesty. And this is a poem by a person that shows that. It's called The Motherland's Call, a short poem. Strike, brothers, strike a blow for England's sake. Brave hearts that blow shall even stronger make. When England calls, what British heart would shirk? She only calls a need for empire's work. Colonial hearts and loyal must stir, face danger, death, faith, all for sake of her. They rush to aid her, and for England stand, no distance chills the love of motherland. So he arrived in Britain, 1915, joined the Royal Air Corps. At first, he served as an air mechanic. But in late 1915, he was posted to France as a driver and with a balloon company. And in a letter, letter to his mother, he wrote in 1917, he described the work as directing artillery fire, but added the balloons can't do anything unless it's a clear day, which is very rare now as it is still winter. And he enclosed a small piece of green balloon fabric as a keepsake to his mother and said he wanted to transfer to a fighter uh, squadron. And he was finally accepted to undergo pilot training in England. He had completed the course in 1917 and he became a pilot. He was promoted to sergeant in 1917, returned to England, joined the uh, number four squadron in Belgium, and began to fly for, for, England, uh, for England. Now, along with that, he was on a, a photographic mission aboard a plane, and the plane was attacked, the photographic mission was attacked by enemy fighters. And he said to his mother, I was doing some photographs a few miles the other side when about five Hun scouts came down upon me. And before I could get away, I got a bullet through the spine. I managed to pilot the machine nearly back to the aerodrome, but had to put her down as I was too weak to fly anymore. My observer escaped injury. So he received the Silver War Badge issued to those honor, honorary released from the service. So that's uh, Robbie Clark. Now the next person that we'll take a look at is Pierre Rijon. He was the first black French military pilot to fly during World War I. Other blacks flew for France, but they were not French citizens. He was the French citizen. And he was one of three pilots with the Allied Air Force, along with Eugene Ballard and another black pilot. And he was the first French pilot, black French pilot, whose victories were recognized by the French armed forces. So he was born in 1895 in the West Indies, in the island of Martinique. He excelled in school, went to France to study engineering. And uh, after he arrived, World War I began. He volunteered for the 33rd Infantry Battalion. He was sent to south of France for training, promoted to second lieutenant. And in 1917, he became a student in the military, the, the uh, French Military Air Academy. And that's where he piloted his fighter plane. He named his aircraft Zaza, Z-A-Z-A, -Z -A, in memory of his beloved younger sister, Isidé Rijon, because he believed it would believe it would bring him luck against his enemies. He was reckless but talented, 
He shot down, was shot down three times and he survived. Along the way, he damaged 11 German aircraft in combat, shooting down four of them. The French newspapers remarked on his courage, and one newspaper wrote he was a pilot of indomitable courage who on August 10 flew 10 kilometers behind the enemy lines, engaged a very hard fight against opponents superior in number, and shot down a, a German aircraft. At the end of the, of the war, he received the Croix de Guerre, of course, France's highest military um, badge with the bronze palm and also the Belgian Croix de Guerre. He left the army after World War I. However, he did not return to study engineering as he wanted to. And unfortunately, he died in the plane crash, August 15, 1920, while flying over French Guiana. He had just celebrated his 25th birthday. So those are some of the biographies of men who fought as pilots in World War I. So now I guess what we do is look at questions, comments, and so forth. Thank you very much, Professor June. I just want to invite any participants who have questions to type them into the Q&A feature, and we would be happy to um, read them for Professor June to answer, or you can raise your hand. I see a hand raised by Brian Cook. Now, hold on, let's see. Okay, um, Brian, I have, you should be allowed to, to talk now, so if you could unmute yourself. Thank I you. just want to thank George for a fantastic presentation. And I wanted to know where he got most of his information from. Okay, I'll tell you, Brian. Brian and I are buddies. <laughs> <laughs> so of course he asked me a real hard question here. Um, Brian, what I did is that because I went to high school in Verdun, I started collecting some information from there, not knowing that I was ever going to be presenting on this. So a little bit here, a little bit there, I knew some sources. And it wasn't until probably about 20 years ago that I realized that I had a little bit of information on Eugene Ballard. And uh, some, uh, some friends, a friend of my father, <clears throat> had a, a kid in school and uh, K-12 and the kid we did a report on Ballard and the teacher wouldn't accept the report because it said there were no black fighter pilots in World War I. <laughs> oh, wow. So I started from there and I just go online, I just go all over. Um, as you probably know, I, I'm a visiting professor at Bawazici University in Istanbul and that's how I found out about Ahmed Ali. And because uh, I'd never even heard of him before. And of course, he's fighting a, a side against the United States, but there is a lot of information on him in Turkey. And so I just started putting all this stuff together. And then I had a student of mine, Bill Esch, who was a sheriff deputy, and he did a report on uh, Ballard and World War I. And he's the one that found what I call the yearbook in the library with two of Ballard's pictures. I didn't even know that that was even there. So I just a little bit of stuff scattered around and just staying up late at night, going through anything I could find and uh, getting books through the interlibrary alone and getting some newspaper uh, clippings as, as rare as they are and some other journal articles. So it's taken me, it's taken me probably a period of uh, 20 years, not every day or every night, just a little bit over here, a little bit there and stuff like that to pull together. Uh, this work. Am I muted? Thank no. you so much. I, I wondered if you would plan to do a program on the Tuskegee Airmen. I have done one of those, and I can uh, uh, I can pull I can pull that out. And I don't have as much. I mean, the information is there. Much more information on this one, but I of course I can pull together information on that group as well. Thank you. I have a, f a French friend who sends me emails, and I'm sure he would love to get a copy of your presentation. Not a problem. Awesome. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. We are recording this presentation. So um, after we do a little editing, we will be posting it on the city's website or on the city's YouTube channel. So thank you, Betsy. Oh, you're awesome. very welcome. Thanks for attending. What other questions can <laughs> Professor June answer for you all? Do you want to ask? All right. Well, I don't see anybody raising their hand or any questions in the Q and A. So I believe this concludes the event, unless somebody raises their hand. All right. Well, thank you all very much for coming, and thank you very much, Professor June, for doing this presentation. It was fantastic. And if you have other presentations you would like to present in the future, we would love to host you. And actually that would also go for anybody else who has presentations. There is a note in the Q&A from um, Ms. Blackburn. Thanks for the information, Dr. June. And another one from a Ms. Cohen. Thank you, so interesting. And then another one from uh, Ms. Mitchell. Thank you, Dr. June. So thank you very much. We really appreciate it. And I hope everybody enjoyed it. And we look forward to future brown bags. Thank you very much, too, for the opportunity. <laughs>